Okay, good morning. Good morning. Hi. All right, we know you have lots of choices when trying to decide how to spend your Saturday morning, right? Um, and we're happy that you all chose to be here. I'm Jennifer Knippen, and I am a professor of management and strategy over at Eckerd College, so your neighbor right across the bridge. And I'm Chris Mason. I'm a professor of finance and dean of business school at Concordia College in Minnesota. And I'm a lifelong entrepreneur. So identifying opportunities is really, really critical, and hopefully you'll get that from what we're going through today. Thanks. And for those of you I didn't get to in the back, my name is Joe Cabral. I'm from Louisiana State University. I teach corporate entrepreneurship. And this is my first weekend meeting these two, so it's a very <laughs> exciting time for all of us as well as you. Yeah. So. Well, great. OK, so for our objectives for today, you all, hopefully, right, you all received the case for, in for IntelliFit. We're going to talk about how to assess opportunities, okay? So how to evaluate the opportunity that's presented in that case so we can decide, you know, which opportunities are those that we should pursue um, and which that we should ignore, okay? So an important part of entrepreneurship, certainly. Okay, so first, though, we're going to get to know you a bit, all right? So I want to ask you all, how is it that you shop, particularly for clothes? Where do you buy your clothes? Marshalls. Marshalls? Okay, so we have Marshalls. Where else? TJ Maxx. Marshalls, TJ Maxx. Kohl's and Macy's. Kohl's and Macy's. Okay. Any others? The mall. The mall. So you go to the mall to shop. Others that go to the mall by raise of hands? Okay, about half of you. Anybody go to specialty stores? Amazon. Amazon specialty store. Those that shop online? Online. <coughs> online shopping? Okay, so and how do you determine whether or not these clothes fit? Okay, you're shopping online versus going in the store. How are you assessing fit? Say that one more time for me. Yeah. Okay, okay, so how many people try them on in the store? Sometimes. Okay, usually try them on in the store, or how many people just buy it and take it home and take a chance? All right, sometimes you do that too. Okay, and then you return it if it doesn't fit? Sometimes no. Okay, so sometimes no, now it just goes in the closet. Um, maybe it'll be donated at some point then as well. Okay, anyone that's gone for a fitting? Anyone that has had a special occasion or something that you've had to go for a fitting? Okay, so these are other ways, right, that we try to find um, things that fit. Anyone who shops online? Do you, those that shop online, do you use the sort of sizing guides and things that they have online to try to reduce that as well? Okay, so let's talk about IntelliFit, right? Because it's about shopping and it's about fitting as well. All right, so what is the IntelliFit technology? What is this? What are they proposing? Right, thanks. It's basically the airport scanners that use to digitally decide what size you are. Okay, I like the airport scanners, but you used to decide <coughs> what size you are. Now, was this their first iteration, those at IntelliFit? Okay, coming up with this technology, what did they try first then? Yes. And measuring tape. Okay, so yeah, and even before that, right, they sent these kits out, they mailed these kits out, okay, so that you could measure and send them in. Was, was there a good response or return on that? Yeah. Okay, not so much. All right, so then what did they decide to do? the measurement, right? And they were working with these specialty stores. Sorry. It's okay. Let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, right? Where they had the actual measuring tape, right? This is what happens when you go to get measured for a special event. Okay, and so here you see in this picture they have four basic measurements. How many were required for the IntelliFit when they were before the technology when they were sending out the tape and technology or the tape measuring to the store? Yeah. 38. 38. Okay, so here's four. Now imagine uh, we have, you know, what, 32 uh, more places to, to measure. Okay, so then they propose essentially what looks like this airport scanner. Okay, okay, so we'll come, we'll start, we're going to start to evaluate. But first, okay, let's take a vote. Okay, how many think that this is an opportunity worth pursuing? Oh, some background music. Okay, by raise of hands, opportunity worth pursuing. Two, three, raise them high. Let's, 
All right, it's okay. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Okay, those that would walk away from this opportunity. Everybody else. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty, twenty-one, twenty-two, twenty-three, twenty-four, twenty-five, twenty-six, twenty-seven, twenty-eight, twenty-nine, thirty, thirty-one, thirty-two, thirty-three, thirty-four, thirty-five, thirty-six, thirty-seven, thirty-eight, thirty-nine, forty, forty-one, forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven, forty-eight, forty-nine, 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 forty-two, forty-three, forty-four, forty-five, forty-six, forty-seven,
what do they do that drives revenue? Not really on the retail level. They're providing a service. They are providing a service, but are they, are they providing a service or are they providing a product? Right. So what's the obvious way IntelliFit looks at cash flow, driving cash flow? Putting out the... Putting out the machines. Yeah. How about selling the machines? That's how they make money initially, right? They sell these machines to various, various retailers, various uh, malls. Uh, we talked about that, but ultimately, who would think that their revenue is really derived by moving more machines? People come by machines and they don't know if they work. True. That's definitely right. part of it. Mm -hmm. Why would a mall buy a machine that doesn't service more towards the online shopping behavior? Why would they do that? That's the big question. Because if you think it from IntelliFit standpoint, it would be in every mall, it'd be in every, every location we talked about, every gap, every, uh, you know, um, what gap and um, uh, Levi's maybe, yes. Is it supposed to be a response to like the Amazon type like effect we're seeing that's crashing retail stores where like the biggest complaint online is things don't fit and so the only selling <coughs> point a store would have is if you could get a perfect fit? So it's really, uh, focused on perfect fit, and again, remember this is 2004. Amazon's <coughs> selling books at this point. They really haven't launched into selling everything in the whole world. And so this happens to be a product they're focusing on, clothing, that fit does matter. And we have the, the benefit of time now to look back and say, well, Amazon's going to get huge. This really does fit something that's going to happen. So my friend Chris here is, uh, is giving you a number of ways that the company is going to make money. But let's look at them in turn for a second. So if IntelliFit's customer is the mall, why is the mall going to buy this? Or why is a particular store going to buy this? You, you have an idea? Uh, I don't believe that the mall is going to buy this. Ah, so you, you see problems right at the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> why? <laughs> Nobody's going to buy this. Yeah. No, I don't believe that okay. the department is not going to buy this. OK, tell me why. Because like, it will help the, the customer. OK. It's easier than going and using the fitting room. For example, if someone is going to the mall store and they don't have this product, Yeah, so this is a good point, right? So, so really your, your value is for the original, uh, the, the one co uh, company. But somebody over here said, I, I know my, comp my stores. I know what fits at that store. So if I'm only really providing value from one store's perspective, where's that value going to come from then? I already know what I like. I already know what fits. And if I have to try on things once at one store, you know, how much pain is that really for me as a customer? Somebody else had a hand over here? Okay, so now we could have this device that could be attractive as a differentiator maybe between malls. And, and you come to my mall because I have this fitting thing. But it only tells you anything of value if you have stores that have signed up for it. So you start to have this chicken or the egg problem, right? And I'm not really sure if I'm the store, you know, you're asking me to invest in a product or time into a product that you're also going to give everybody else at the mall an opportunity to, to, to use. So there, there's some weird things going on, for sure. Anyone else? How about this? Is it really a differentiator for the malls? Yeah, I, don't, I don't know. Let's pretend there's two malls in Tampa, and one has this device, suddenly, tomorrow, and one doesn't. And you need to go to the mall to buy a few outfits, possibly from other stores, uh, different stores. Which mall do you go to? Whichever mall has my store. 
OK, which everyone has your stores. OK. So, so another interesting aspect, right? Do I really care about the fit, or do I like my style? And, and that's what drives me to buy from a certain person. And if you don't have my store in your mall, I don't care if you have this, this funky box. But let's suppose one mall does have the box, and you, for some reason, decide, I will use this. What happens the next time you make a purchase? Do I need to go back to that same mall, or can I take those same printouts and go to maybe another mall that I like better, because it has different stores that maybe aren't in the first one, and that's why I'm going. So you start to have, on the surface, some pretty clear value propositions, but as you start poking, you say, ooh, you know, there's some really strong assumptions here that we need to worry about before we're willing to commit to believing we have strong revenue models. There is an opportunity that somebody will pay us for. Yeah, and, and as a part of that, when I think back and, and assume for a minute that IntelliFit's whole purpose is to move machines, what happens to the structure Joe is speaking of when both malls have the machine? So how does that allow a mall to differentiate themselves from, in this case, one other mall or many malls within the city, which there are? Yes. Why, why does it have to go in a mall? That's one of the markets that they could, could use to go business to business and then get the customer, ultimate customer that's going to use it, to come in and be a part of it. That was, malls was one of the option. What was another option? It seems like Jamie has an idea. Where, where do you see it? Well, What's the show? It's like, I would use that for my children because you can't never get the size right. <laughs> but think of stories you're going with children, which are Target, Walmart. I'm not going to take them to the mall. And that's why we shop online. And I'm not going to go to a mall just to get measured to shop online. I'd go somewhere that's very convenient, a Walmart or Target, which is on every corner. And you know, like some Publix have an actual pharmacy in it. Some Targets would actually have this in it. Okay. Well, more people shop. And that's a great point. What happens with kids? They grow. They grow. So their 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 sizes are changing. Hopefully not like us. It's mine tend to go out a little bit, but uh, I've not gotten any taller lately. So it does change. So having accessibility to the machines sounds like a real advantage. But as as uh, Amaretta was speaking of, once you get measured. Is that initial benefit gone to whoever had spent the money? By the way, how much do one of these machines cost? $50,000. So once this mall spends $50,000 or a retailer spends this $50,000, the retail customer has all the data, assuming they haven't grown yet. So is it, is it uh, something that can be the model to be rep uh, repeatable on a consistent basis? Or is it just a one-time deal? Amaretto. My biggest problem with this machine is the perfect fit. Like, what is the perfect fit? Like, that's what I don't understand. Like, where do they get the perfect fit? Where do they, you know what I mean? How do they know those measurements are the <coughs> perfect fit that the customer is looking for? Right, right. So. You, were, you define a perfect fit differently than maybe Jamie does. A nice fat, fat feeling compared to something that's maybe a little loose so I can raise my hands. But, right, but we no, all perception. You want something looser for a certain outfit. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you want something tighter. Sometimes you want something longer. Sometimes you want something shorter. You know what I'm saying? I so do. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Do you, mm -hmm. yeah, the perfect fit is not necessarily the perfect fit ev for everything that you need. Yeah, What's it? Yes. So how do you actually solve that problem? And keep <laughs> keep and keep trying and keep trying until you find a product that fits. Yeah. Yeah. I have the same. I have the same issue. And I, I uh, you know, I, I wear a lot of suits. My neck is big. My arms are long. They assume I'm this big. And one leg's shorter than the other, and one arm's longer than the other. It's tough. And so the idea of what's the perfect fit, is that more individualistic? Yeah, can we actually continue with Alexis's point, though? 
if you get a machine that perfectly tells you what your measurements are, but there's no clothes that fit that measurement, which seems to be a problem if you're constantly trying on things, they're kind of promising something that they not really can deliver in, in your situation. It's like not their fault, just like the retailers. Because you understand, like, if you're a nine, you're a nine, you're a seven, you're a seven. It's not the case. So, so maybe the situation becomes maybe the specialty shops make sense. Mm -hmm. And this initial positioning of a mall with, you know, churn and burn type clothing doesn't make sense. Like I said, that's a great question. And so when malls um, rent space to Gap and to uh, whatever, especially retailer does Buckle, they also get, receive a percentage of revenues. So would there be a change in revenue if the mall had this machine? I get a no. Anybody saying yes? The, the, what is the length? So how long does it take in the machine to get your measurements? Mm -hmm. Very, very quick, so that's the big benefit. Kind of like going through the airport and you know, seeing if I have anything metal on my body at this point. One, we, we, uh, one, of the, one of the benefits we're looking at is the use of the data. That's what I was thinking. Like, if you just have like, a smaller like, tool container, I'm not sure if that's invasion of privacy or not. Invasion of privacy. Who wants their measurements somewhere else that can be used by someone else's healthcare? <laughs> healthcare. Private information. Does a person. Do I want someone to really know I've got a 36 waist? Because I kind of think in Levi's I have a 34. <laughs> Anybody concerned about the use of that data? Why would we be concerned about the use of that data? Where could it end up? If you're giving that control up, where could it end up? Who knows? Maybe it'll show up on Facebook and they'll say, Chris really doesn't have a 44 chest uh, and his belly is actually bigger than his chest. To what you're saying, that they already have the information, Mike. Yeah. And when you buy it, it gets tracked to whatever account you have or whatever credit card you use. So, like that data is already used. Yes, so free John. Machine, right? like, is it free? Yeah. For the customer. So, where are they getting their information from? Like, are you typing in your name? Yes, I assume there's got to be some sort of way to track who you are. Was there any detail in how that works? Maybe just made an account. They had a barcode and you can make your account and then that's how you get onto your mobile like training numbers and stuff like that. Yes. Yeah. I think most yeah. of this machine is probably like ten years ahead of its time. I think right now at this point, I don't think as many people use it. I think in like ten years maybe, you know, people always want to make their life easier. So I, I think sooner or later everything will go towards technology and this will be, you know, something that people will use, maybe not so big, maybe a little smaller instead of fitting in, you can walk in, it scans you, you go, you pick your clothes up. I don't know. I just think right now, I don't think this will be successful. But I think like, you know, sooner or later something like this will definitely end up once. Yeah. Yep. And and so it's maybe ahead of its time. I think so. Right That's now. one big question.
they could refine the technology more to the point where they could make it smaller, more compact. Okay. Amy. I think this is a good business for um, online sales because that's where we need to know. Then we don't have to sit there like with the charts and stuff. If we go there, we can like scan our thing and know like what stores you can buy everything from. It would be. But I don't think it needs to be in a mall. I think it needs to be like, you know, Amazon has the lockers, certain places. It needs to be somewhere like that where you can get measured and be done. Because the mall, the shopping experience is going in and trying on and hanging out. That's what teens go to hang. It's a hanging out place. That's why a lot of older people will not go to the mall. We don't want to deal with the teenagers. We don't want to deal with all that stuff. We want to shop online and get our stuff done. So a mall, I mean, unless the teenagers want to use it, I just don't think it's a great fit for the mall. Yeah. Before we uh, grab her. Let's, let's stick with that question for a second, though, because how many of us have a certain waist or a certain size, if we're, if we're females, that we wear at one company, and then it doesn't work at another company? How is 32 inches different across four different brands? It doesn't make sense. Fundamentally, there's something going on here. And this is the frustration, though, that the, the device is solving to a degree. If we can partner with you and tell you within Gap, within Old Navy, within you know, a, a higher end one, what your size is, irrespective of what they claim their, their, their size is, there may be value there. Is a problem with Amazon, you know, if I tell you you're a 32 waist, are you sure you're going to get a 32 waist when you order it on Amazon? If you're still buying Gap or Old Navy or, or some other brand that doesn't want you to feel fat, <laughs> <laughs> and suddenly you're a 28 or something or, or whatever. Um, I don't know. I mean, and, and that's, that's the fundamental problem. Is part of this frustration is you can't trust what people tell you the sizes are. They should be standardized to some degree, but they're not. Okay, so we're, we're kind of, we got to remember that, that frustration of if I want to shop at three different stores, why can't I just get the same pants? And it's because they've done something that <coughs> muddies up the process that the machine is a Tempting to, to address. Let me cut you off. Well, I don't think that benefit um, outweighs like the problem with the perfect fit. Like it just, I don't see it working in like in our planning way to like solve that like issue because you still need to feel like the way that like the clothes feel on you. If the computer came out like the way it feels, and you need to like I could probably buy the same shirt at like the same shirt the store and like an extra small small and medium. It all fits me. I don't Yeah, the perfect fit is really the hard part. It's trying to make perfection to what you're saying. You don't necessarily have the same fit every time, so it may not work. Lexa? Right, and so it, it, it may have more specific application, but what does that do then to the revenue potential for IntelliFit? And then if they like change artists and then it's celebrities buy them, it's $50,000 spent and then freelance. <coughs> yeah, they so they're. So Alexis, does that shrink the market for IntelliFit or does it broaden the market for IntelliFit? I think it's helped them differentiate So stylist designers is stylist what you're thinking? So Alexis is also pointing, kind of pointing out to part of what shapes the opportunity is the customer side of things. But she also alluded to how do we currently address the problem? What are competitors doing that may uh, offer a potential solution? And part of what we need to also assess is what is IntelliFit doing and how much better is it than what you already have out there? So let's throw some ideas against the wall. How do we currently figure out what we like, what we're going to wear? We've talked at the beginning. We could just buy and return like me. We've talked about you could get measured. You could have a really intensive measuring session that maybe you don't like, maybe you're okay with. How else? I mean, it wouldn't be all that difficult to uh, 
technology to solve the same problem where all that happens is a company goes out, they specifically um, look at the size of the bank physically, measure the size of it, and then just publish that data online. And then it would be a size comparison chart between various brands. So if you know you mm -hmm. fit one pair of jeans, you can fit all the other ones now. I like what you're doing. You're addressing this problem from a totally different market mechanism. <laughs> Opportunity. Go for it. <laughs> so, Mike, would you think that that would also change the clothing retailers to come to more of a common size structure? Because a size 6 here is maybe a size 4 here. I feel like the, the reason why that happens is because marketing and social psychology. So I don't think it benefits the company at all. It's more for the consumer side of things. I feel the main issue with this technology is it tries to fit way too many solutions to way too many problems, and it doesn't do any of them particularly well, where like every other solution that we've listed, there's way cheaper and way more accurate ways to go about it. And so it just doesn't have potential in that regard. And importantly, yeah, customers are already doing that, right? Yeah. So I don't, I don't need to change my behavior. Right. I, I'm okay with what we're doing. Mm -hmm. Lexi, do you have a thought? Yeah, it's, uh, it, I used to work in a shoe store when I was 17, and everyone had a size five and a half. Females, and generally men were nine. More often than, time, more often than not, the five was a six and a half, and the nine was a ten and a half, but they had that in their mind. So that's probably the, the psychological side that, that Mike was talking about, that you know, it's, that's what drives a lot of the changes. Is there a real competitor here at this moment in 2004? Not at this moment. Yeah, so eventually, as, as Jamie is pointing out, we have the Internet being developed, which may have much more application for the Amazons of the world, or actually the Amazon since it's only one. Uh, and one would think you know, that that would be something that could benefit them. Amaretta? I think instead of focus on clothing, they should focus on like giving them maybe to like sports teams or something like that to where they can help get the players in better shape. You know, you got like the Bucks, maybe they want their old linemen to have two percent, I mean, uh, seven, eight percent body fat instead of 15 or wherever they're at. I'm just saying just mm -hmm. the number. So more of a health. So more of a, I think this could help more of a health issue and more of a, a clothing because fashion is becoming bigger and bigger. And if you're really into fashion, you're not going to go into a machine like this and let it find your perfect fit. Because like I said, everything fits differently. And if you're really into fashion and you, you like your clothing, you're going to go try everything on and be very specific on what you get and it's the sizes. Mm -hmm. So I think this will help more with getting in shape and helping, you know, maybe with athletes or helping with, you know, things like that. So more of a health issue. Alexis, do you have a So do you need a $50,000 machine to go stand in to do it <laughs> as technology is developed? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Lexi? Well, and one important thing in looking at the opportunity is not just our stage in life, but think of people that are older, 40, 50, 60, 70, that didn't grow up walking through a machine and doing this in the airport. Right. Would, do you think they'd like that? Is that, is that, a, is that something that uh, it, they look at it differently than we do at, in our 20s? Or you're a creep and you just want to see stuff. Yeah. 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 So it changes with age. And now at some point, believe it or not, you'll be in your 40s. But you've come to use this machine and it's just part of life. 
over time, it may have another impact on it. So it's not just what we're looking at now as an opportunity, but what's it going to be going forward? We have the benefit to look back now at the internet, how it's really changed everything, and Amazon's booming every single year as a part of those sales. So as much as we're having fun, we only have limited time with you. Um, so let's try and wrap this up. Okay, so let's take another vote. Let's see if anyone's opinions have changed. All right, those that would pursue this opportunity, hands up. One, two, three. What about in 10 years? So we can get Amoretto to raise his hand. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so assuming we've had some, some movement here. Okay, pursuing this opportunity now as is, or pursuing this opportunity if it needs to change, maybe applied to a different market, as the case might be. Okay, so if we said pursuing this opportunity, but perhaps pivoting and applying it to a different application in market. Now I'm getting some maybes, some maybes. One, two, three, maybe on the fence, maybe four, five. Okay. All right, so maybe five if we change this application, pivot, apply it to a different market or different opportunity. Okay, so what really happened? I always like to update the case at the end. So in 2005, they went ahead and piloted um, at six different malls, all right, in, in major cities. Tampa was one of them. Okay, then they went and they deployed globally in over three tail, 30 retail stores and promotional locations. Okay, so they were in Levi's. See, those are love Levi's, at Levi's, and even at some NASCAR uh, promotional events, which I have to think about that one a little bit, um, a little bit more. And then in 2009, they were acquired. They were acquired by Unique Solutions Limited, which is a Canadian company, okay? And this is a tech company, all right? So what do you think they were primarily interested in? The data, okay? So this was a tech company that were looking at body mass index and other factors. So they were actually interested in the data as well, and then they rolled it out further. So then in 2011, it was in more than 70 malls, okay, multiple Bloomingdale's. So this is where they were targeting. Okay, then what happened? In 2014, they announced massive layoffs and stopped using the machine. So what happened? Well, as it turns out, okay, by and large, the women, they weren't actually that interested okay, and getting that much data about themselves, okay, maybe a little t a TMI, if you will, okay, we, they didn't want to know that much information, okay, the measurements were more detailed than the store's offering, so this was part of the conversation that you had here, okay, so now you've given me really detailed measurements, now what? I'm still b between a size five or seven or whatever the case <coughs> might be, right, Gap and others aren't adjusting to custom, customize size. So they didn't really know what to do with that data. It wasn't helping them in the way that, that they felt that they were promised. Okay, but there was one segment that actually really enjoyed this technology. Okay, can anyone guess who that might have been? At the retailers. Airports. Not, well, airports definitely enjoy this technology. What about shoppers? Demographic of a shopper. The women didn't like it, but guess who ended up liking it? Yeah. The men. Okay, because if they could shave off two more seconds off their shopping trip, they were happy. Okay, so if they could go get their print out, find out exactly what size they were in these stores, they could just go pick up and leave. So they were the marketed, uh, the, the segment that actually seemed to enjoy um, this technology or, or see a real benefit from it. Okay, so when discussing this case, what we're really trying to do is trying to assess an opportunity. Right. So what factors, from our discussion, what factors do you think are really important that you take away from this in assessing whether or not an opportunity is something that should be pursued or something that should be ignored? What factors do you think you should consider? Yes, uh, Kyle. Potential growth, maybe. Okay, the potential growth of the market. Yes. The cost, okay, the cost of the technology itself or the product or service versus the cost itself versus what? The value, perhaps, right? To the customers, to those that are going to purchase it. All right, what else would you want to consider? You all spent a lot of time discussing, yes? The time. The time. Okay, convenience. Going back to the value of your product to the customer. Right? Is it enough to have just cutting edge technology that's really interesting? Okay, if it doesn't, one, serve the purpose that it's intended to serve, 
or is not a value to the customer. So it's good to have, it's important to have, you know, this systematic criteria that we use to apply. Right? We had a huge discussion here about IntelliFit, but IntelliFit wasn't your venture, wasn't your idea. Right? So imagine if it was your idea. Does this exercise or having this systematic criteria become more or less important? When, you are, when you're assessing your own idea. Okay, because it's more difficult, and it's more difficult too, right? Why is it more difficult to assess your own idea? Be you're going to be biased, right? You're excited about this. Okay, so then it becomes even more important to have the systematic criteria that we want to use to assess the market, to assess our customers, to assess the industry, <coughs> the competitors, okay, and, and to have a really clear picture about what the true potential is of this opportunity. Should we pursue it or should we ignore it? If I can add one thing yeah. oh, for the com competitor thing. We, uh, we tend to live in a technology age, and we tend to think that just because we can solve something with technology, it's automatically a better solution. And in this example, that, that's highly questionable. Does it really do anything that much better or provide something that our existing solutions don't already do? So when we, we, we can do something better, but you have to ask, is that really enough of an additional value that you're now going to change the market and people are going to go to your solution? There's a reason you know, the cups or the mouse traps have stayed the same look forever. They do the job well enough that we're okay with it. The pain's not really there for us. So in those situations, if we're going to disrupt that market, we need to do something you know, really revolutionary. And, mm -hmm. and it's questionable if the technology here truly did that. Okay. So we're out of time. Well, thank you all so, so, so much for your time and attention. Thanks.